Hello and welcome to the Pirate Spaceship. So if you find yourself here, you are probably considering playing Pathfinder Kingmaker. Well, let me be honest with you, this is not an easy one, especially for beginners. It's a game that demands some strategic thinking, some planning, and most importantly, a great deal of patience. But fear not, because I, Morgan the Cat, put this guide together to make your journey a bit easier. Now, Kingmaker is a pretty big game, so I'm gonna split this guide up, and today we're gonna introduce the game and all the basic mechanics that you will encounter. And since I'm a rookie myself, there is only one thing you can expect. That in truly pirate fashion, I am gonna be very bad at this. Kingmaker is based on Pathfinder, a tabletop pen and paper RPG that draws from the classic versions of Dungeons and Dragons. But since this is a video for rookies, we are not gonna go into any of that. You just need to know that a good chunk of the lore that you will encounter comes from the pen and paper version, and the game will give you a glossary every time a concept comes up. Born from a crowdfunding project, Kingmaker was brought to life by Owlcat Games. It is a single-player strategy RPG where you will lead your character through adventures and heroic quests to establish and rule your kingdom. As you start a new game, you will have a lot of options in front of you. So this page we skip entirely. You might be tempted to change some of the settings because with the default ones the game looks almost easy. Well, don't. Just move on to the next huge set of options. The character creation system is a deep and intricate process. If you don't want to spend too much time on this, you can just use one of the pre-built characters and move on. But if you want to make your own, here's a quick guide. First, you pick a race, which determines the type of creature that your character is, such as human, elf, orc. There are eight races in total, plus tieflings if you have the wild cards DLC. Each class comes with its own abilities and weaknesses, so for example a dwarf would have an increased constitution and resistance to poison, while an elf has higher dexterity and keen senses that make their perception better, but penalized constitution. Next is the class, which defines the combat style of your character. You can think of the class as what your character studied or trained for. Want to focus mainly on fighting with big heavy weapons? Then pick a character based on strength, like a barbarian, a fighter or a paladin. Want to make things go boom? Then go with an alchemist. Once you pick a class, you can refine it with the archetype, which gives your character even more specific skills. For example, you can make a rogue into a knife master, or into an eldritch scoundrel that can also cast some spells. It ultimately comes down to how you want to play this on the battlefield. Now it's time to attribute points to the six main stats of your character. You should aim to give more points to the two or three skills that match your class. The Pathfinder system actually makes a lot of calculations behind the scenes, and you can always find out how everything works in detail by looking at the encyclopedia. But you can broadly think of the main stats like this. Attacks are usually based on strength, while constitution accounts for resistance. Dexterity is a measure of your character's agility, and it includes things like dodging incoming attacks. But some characters, like rogues, who are agility rather than strength-based, can also use it in attacks. Intelligence is about thinking logically and learning, so it's useful for classes like wizards and alchemists. Wisdom is basically how street smart a character is, and is key for classes that need to be very perceptive, like rangers and druids. Finally, charisma refers to a character's personality and ability to inspire others, and is important for classes like paladins and bards. These stats will be affected both positively and negatively by things like race, equipment, spells, and conditions like diseases or poison. If any of them drops below zero, your character dies. The next step is assigning points to your skills. There are various types of skills, based on the six main stats, so based on the class and race, each character will be particularly proficient in specific ones. Skills are used to determine if your characters can complete certain actions, in combat, while exploring and while camping. For example, picking a lock requires a trickery check, while cooking requires a knowledge of the world one. When making skill checks, dice rolls are used behind the scenes. So it can happen that if the first time you fail to disable a trap, the second time you succeed, or you fail even harder, triggering the trap and killing almost the whole party. After that you will have a bunch more stuff to choose, like the feat, a special bonus that your character gets either in or outside of combat. You will gain more of these as your character levels up, with also some useful team ones. The spells available to your character if your class has any. For some races or classes, specific details or power, like a favorite enemy type for rangers. 
And finally, the alignment, which determines the moral of your character and how they think and behave. Alignment moves along two lines, from good to evil and from lawful to chaotic, which measures the attitude of your character towards things like law, order and tradition. This will partly determine some options available to you in dialogues and the attitude of other characters towards you. And in turn, it will be influenced by the choices you make. You will also have some options to customize the appearance of your character, as well as the portrait that will appear in dialogues and book scenes. The appearance is probably the aspect of the game with more limitations. And look at this smile, this damn smile. But to be fair, it's probably also the least important thing, because you won't see your character that much in details anyway. So really, just pick a portrait that you think represents your character best. Not like me, stuck with this resting bitch face. The character creation screen will come back less in detail when you will level up your characters. You will have more skill points to assign and new spells to learn, new feats to gain and more powers to unlock. You will get to do this for all of your companions as well, and if you don't want to do it, you can just load the pre-made builds for them. When you level up, you can choose to add the level to your current class or multi-class your character taking levels in another class. This will give your character the benefits of both classes, but at a lower level. And as a beginner, I wouldn't do it at least for the first chapter of the game. And if you want to experiment, you will have Octavia, who is a wizard and a rogue. The story starts in the mansion of the Aldori, a noble family of sword lords in the nation of Brevoy. The leader of the house, Lady Jomandi, invited several adventurers to take part in an expedition to free the Stolen Lands, an unclaimed region west of Brevoy, now unlawfully ruled by a gang of bandits led by the Stag Lord. Those who manage to free the Stolen Lands will become Baron of the region. Now, the Aldori have some of the best militia in the country, but why would you sacrifice your noble sword lords when you can form a party of penniless adventurers with the promise of a red relatively useless title instead. And obviously we are one of the adventurers. This is actually a good spot to introduce the other members of the expedition. The first we meet is Lindsay, a halfling bard who got kicked out of art school for writing some satire on King Ivoretti. And since then she traveled around looking for a hero worthy of her pen. She's a chaotic good character, tiny and direct, doesn't like anything that's evil, and really just wants to write her books. There's Amiri, a human barbarian who comes from a tribe where women are relegated as housewives, but she wasn't gonna have any of that. She's a chaotic neutral character and basically only cares about fighting monsters to get increasingly bigger. Valerie is a human fighter who ran away from an order of paladins because people complimented her too much. She has a thing about proving her worth with her actions rather than her beauty, which is cool, yet she manages to be extremely uptight with everyone. At some point she insults another character because he says that the sky is nice. Herim is the most pessimistic dwarf on the planet. Honestly, he must have been the model behind Marvin the Android's true personality. He was never able to forge anything, which is kind of a big deal for dwarves, so everyone abandoned him because they thought he was cursed. He then found a new family in the worshippers of Groetus, the god of end times, and has since then been going around telling everyone that they will die soon. Jaethel is an evil undead elf that I would not put in charge of an R&D department. She got exiled after killing several family members members for some of her experiments, then she woke up dead, and yes, that's a thing when you're undead, and since then has devoted herself to the god of death and chaos, Urgatoa. Oh, and there's Tartuccio, a gnome with a weird obsession for the color purple and a very inflated sense of self. He basically already declared himself the Baron of the Stolen Lands, even though you haven't even left the place yet. So you mingle a bit with the guests, then go to your room to rest for the expedition on the day after. In the middle of the night, though, a group of assassins assaults the mansion aiming for Lady Aldori. Here is where the tutorial starts. You will have to make your way through the Aldori mansion, back to the throne room, and resist the attack, picking up the other characters on the way. The game has two fighting modes, real-time fighting and turn-based. In real-time fighting, you can choose a specific enemy for your characters to attack, select specific moves, but your party will do most of the stuff by itself. This mode is good when you have to clear a place from enemies that are easily manageable, and being faster it will save you some time. Honestly, I'm not using this mode so much, because I really like the turn-based fighting. In turn-based mode, each character will take a turn to move and attack or cast spells. For each turn, a character can take a move action and a standard action. The move action can be used to move around for as many feet as the speed determined by the race and the armor allows. It can also be spent to consume restorative potions or it can be switched for a 5 foot step. In this mode, a character will only be able to move 5 feet, but they will not provoke any attack of opportunity. So it's good when moving amongst numerous enemies. If you move, you won't be able to use 5 feet in the same turn, but if you use your move action for something else, then you will still be able to use the 5 feet. The standard action is used to attack, cast spells, drink potions, or as an extra move action. 
attack and move actions can also be combined into a full attack, so characters will attack twice. And you can use either your move action or your standard action to change your character's weapons. Then you have free actions and swift actions. You can take one swift action per turn while free actions are unlimited. They are used to activate special abilities, so things like adding bonuses to weapons, armors or characters. These might seem like a relatively minor thing, but actually they can be very effective. Some spells, like the ones to summon allied creatures, will take up both the move and the standard action. Some other spells will require a touch attack to succeed, and some will create various combinations of actions. The order in which characters take turns depends on their initiative. If you manage to sneak in on your opponents, you will also get a surprise round, where your opponents will skip the first turn, but you won't have your move action. Each character has specific abilities and weaknesses, and spells and effects take into consideration all of those. For example, skeletons only take full damage from bludgeoning weapons, while damage from other weapons against them is reduced by 10 points. Snails are immune to acid, some trolls will be immune to fire, and so on and so forth. The fighting system is actually a lot more in-depth and complex than this. It keeps track of things like combat maneuvers, the type of terrain, the position on the map, but since we are beginners, we can ignore that for now. The game mainly goes forward by exploration and dialogues. Dialogues are in text, and you have options to choose. Some options will always be available, while some will be exclusive. Some options will only be available if you pass a skill check, while some will require a skill check after you choose the reply. Some choices will require a specific alignment and or will influence your alignment, as well as the opinion of your companions and sometimes the story too. You will also encounter some book passages. These are events in the game where you read what is happening as if it was written by Lindsay. They work like dialogues and you will have options to choose from, or you might have skill checks to pass. And they usually come with some nice illustrations. For example, one of these will be already in the tutorial mission, when you will go through a building on fire and you will have to make a couple of decisions about running to Jamandi or slow down to save a couple of guards who got trapped. When you manage to get back to the throne room, you will take part in a pretty big fight involving a frost giant and stuff. But don't worry too much, because between the fact that you are gonna have a huge party and that Jamandi is pretty OP, you won't really have a problem. It's more like a battle to show you how cool the fights will become, since for the next couple of levels they're gonna be really bad. So you fight here and there, there are lots of people dead, a proper massacre in the mansion, and Lady Eldori is like, okay, so I did notice all the dead bodies around, but I don't really care, we are gonna start the expedition now. At this point, Tartuccio tries to cut you out by attempting to convince Lady Aldori that you were the spy for the assassins, and several other things. Aldori decides that she trusts neither of you anyways, so she decides to organize two groups. The other characters are free to go with whoever they prefer, so if you were lawful you get Valerie, otherwise you get Harim, if you were good you get Lindsay, otherwise you get Jetta. Amiri will come with you by default, because she just can't stand Tartuccio, and honestly because without her your party would get nowhere until they reach at least level 4. At this point, Jamandi will send you and your newly foreign party to Oleg's trading post, in the outskirts of the Stolen Lands. Here you will already meet the Stag Lords gang for the first time, and then it will become your base for the whole chapter 1. You will be able to rest, trade weapons, spells and potions, and talk to your party members. Ok, I think I talked enough for today. Stay tuned for part 2, where I'm gonna go through some tips and tricks for beginners that will hopefully help you in the game. If you liked the video, consider leaving us a like and checking out our channel. Thank you for watching, and a goodbye from the pirate spaceship.